Hi guys and welcome to Working Parents on Lockdown. It's my video series where I've been speaking to mums and dads about how we're coping at the moment with the kids around 24-7 whilst we're trying to get our careers going as well. Today I am joined by one of my oldest and dearest friends, Ibs. Um, we met when we studied journalism for our masters down in uh, West Wales, University of Westminster but out in West London on the campus in Harrow. Ibs and I were always the first ones down in the uh, student bar on a Wednesday afternoon so we bonded over a shared love of um, being able to be in the pub, I think, didn't we? So um, Ibs and I have also got a shared love of football, which is something that we are both uh, sort of have followed in our careers, although you so definitely more than, than me. Um, so Ibs, do you want to introduce yourself and tell everyone what it is you do? Hi there. Um, as Amy says, uh, just a fellow functioning alcoholic, I think, is the best way of starting it. Now, um, journalist, we studied journalism together. Um, after we finished our course, I got a job at the BBC, which probably sounds more glamorous than it actually was at the time. Um, I did a lot of stuff with them over the course of many years. And then eventually, I think it was yeah, 2016, it was I left there to go to the Mirror um, and then uh, doing sports video journalism for them. And then uh, after three years there, I went uh, to work for Yahoo Sport and do sports video journalism for them. Uh, after a year of that, I was uh, made redundant. And that was January, February this year. Um, and since then, I've just been freelancing, freelance football writing for the last few months. And um, yeah, that's where we are right now. Oh, and in all that, I happen to have a wonderful little girl who doesn't listen to me. Her name is Isabella. She is 14 months old and she's not here at the moment, but she's gone for a walk with her mother. But uh, yeah, you would hear her if she was here. <laughs> to making herself known. Mm. She, uh, did you celebrate her first birthday in lockdown or was that just before? We did. Yep, yep. Three of us celebrating birthday in lockdown. Yeah, she doesn't like cake, which is interesting considering how much her parents love cake. So... So obviously it's been a bit of a dramatic year for you and you, like myself, have made a decision to sort of commit to freelancing for the foreseeable future, uh, we'd like to think. Um, how was it making that decision for you? Um, essentially, it was the decision was made for me. Um, like I said, I was made redundant in February from Yahoo, which came as a bit of a shock. There was no indication it was going to happen. Um, and then I thought to myself, you know what, I've been working non-stop flat out for the last what are we now 2020 so since I we finished our masters 2008 so 12 years straight I've just been working I thought you know what, I'll take maybe a month or two to maybe just relax for a bit and then throw myself headfirst into trying to find another job but the coronavirus decided that it didn't want to adhere to my plans so <laughs> I had to try and find freelance work or try and find any work really so I was applying for jobs that in the field which were potentially I was able to do remotely but nothing sort of came of that I think people just weren't hiring from sort of March time uh, and so I ended up almost like I said I worked in the mirror and the sort of the parent company there were Reach PLC who own the mirror and a lot of other regional titles around the country and other national papers including obviously the Express and the Star which they bought a couple of years ago um, so yeah, uh, one of my contacts there offered me some freelance football writing over the course of, well, my football was suspended. It was a case of just trying to essentially, don't want to do it down too much, but fill space, you know, trying to write sort of transfer stuff, uh, analysis, player sort of investigations, things like that, just to keep the football content flowing while there was no football actually being played. And I've been doing that for a couple of months now and um, yeah, really enjoying it. And um Obviously, as far as freelancing goes, it I'm happy with it. it it's, the, the work is, com is comfortable for me in terms of trying to raise a child as well in lockdown. And um, beyond that, also hopefully one day perhaps to use my other skills in terms of video editing to maybe get freelance work in that, if that's possible. I mean, I can do that remotely. I can sit here on my laptop and do video editing if I want to. And um, voiceover work as well. I mean, it's something I tried to get into a little while back um with sort of limited success but in the last couple of months i've had maybe one or two things that you know maybe 
might happen there. So, you know, just 30 second ads online and things like that. So yeah, um, trying to give myself options basically. I really love that idea of, um, because we've all been forced to take a bit of time and life slowing down. It feels like so many people are reflecting on what they actually want to do. So you've gone back to, among many other things, you've gone back to your voiceover, I've gone back to my blog, and it just feels like actually people are realizing they need to put themselves first for once. Mm. Well, this is the thing. It's um, I've also I've had I've got tons of well, this is that you know being out of work for at least that initial stage. I had sort of time to think, like you say, just what do I want to do? And um, I've come up with you know other ideas, sort of creative ideas and things like that that I would hope if given me the time and I'll be able to sort of do those. I mean, you talk about blogging and talking about the sports stuff and the football and everything like that. I have ideas of things I want to do and just it's about just kind of finding the time to do them now. Yeah, that's it. There's always too, there's um, too many ideas now, isn't there? I think I found that when I was sort of in the corporate world, I feel like I was almost stifled and then mm. becoming a freelancer gave me the chance to like use my creativity a bit more. And if I have an idea, I'll write it down and I'll actually do something about it. Whereas when you work with someone else, you've got to go with their ideas and try and sort of fit yourself into that. I mean, I, yeah, I was going to say that I was just going to concur with that completely. You're most, um, I, I guess it's a confidence thing, it, but you almost, when you're in that world, when you're in the working world and you're working for a company, a suggestion that you might come up with, you think is a good idea and actually is a very good idea. All it takes is one person to sort of, eh, and you think, oh no, my idea is terrible. I'm not going to do that. But obviously yeah. now having this freedom to be able to sort of let that idea sort of, germinate and grow within you and you can sort of process it a bit better rather than maybe having a voice that like an external voice telling you hmm, maybe you shouldn't do that or maybe that's not the way or maybe you should amend it and then you think well, okay maybe I won't do it at all but this sort of freedom does allow you to grow those ideas I think. What would you say the pros and cons of doing this kind of work whilst also thinking well I've got to, I've got to provide for little Isabella as well? Well, I mean, it's the the sort of the presence of being at home and seeing your children all the time. It is you do feel guilty if you if you if I turn around and say, right, I just want to spend an hour on the internet doing research for something, and she's there sort of pulling at my leg trying to get my attention. I'm thinking to myself, well, why? What, th- my family is obviously going to be the most important thing here. So why am I? like in these prime years as well in this opportunity as well of being at home for whatever we say about lockdown being at home with your family this these when it's a it's a bonus that we may never sort of get again essentially but um yeah so there is i think mean, the guilt does play a massive part in it in when you're saying like right i want to sit down and just create when you've got a child there that wants your attention <laughs> Yeah, I've just had it just now before I came on the call with you. Had, um, Harry asking, "Mummy, will you come and play with me?" And I felt awful saying, "No, darling, I've got I've got to work because you know they don't get that because you're here, you're at home. Yeah. Mm. You know, as far as they're concerned, you're you're at their beck and call, and so you should be. But yeah. also, you've got to you have got to put yourself first sometimes. When yeah, you don't want to, and because this is the thing, is you know, <laughs> I mean, we're still you know we're parents, but we still think of our we're still quite you know. <laughs> I won't say mentally young, that's probably the wrong expression, but we're still thinking, hold on, if I ignore my child, am I affecting their social skills? Are they going to grow up to each other? Probably not. But we, if I just turn around and Isabella's trying to get my attention, and I say no to it with her, is she going to like, relay this to a therapist in 20 years' time saying, my dad ignored me and I, you know, she, he was never there for me and stuff like that. So, <laughs> well, I'm sure you're not what they remember. What they done, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. sure you'll embarrass her in many more ways. Than oh, yeah, that's, that's a about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's what I was just about to say. I'll never forget. Um, I was down in uh, London watching Millwall Away, and mm-hmm. you and our friend Ed came and met me afterwards. And I, I remember you gesturing to tell me your partner was pregnant. And I was like, oh, my God, Ibs is going to be a dad. That's really weird. And then I was like, well, hang on a minute. So are you, you're like, you're already a mum. Yeah. So there's this weird <laughs> thing of being yeah. adults now, mm. isn't it? And it's yeah. mm. where freelancing when we first graduated probably sounded a little bit glamorous. All of a sudden, it's, it's sort of, um, it takes a very different 
angle almost in your head doesn't it yeah i mean you have um far more responsibilities now which is it just goes without saying and just greater concerns now you know we have become adults just <laughs> sort of somehow and um yeah i mean back then when you're freelancing as a youngster you could live where you want you could you can you know i mean i i sometimes I could go home and live at home for a few months and just, you know, if the money's not coming in or whatever, or, you know, even if I could rent somewhere that's really cheap and crap and that, but now, you know, you've got a mortgage to pay and you're thinking actually, you know, I've got food to put on the table. I can't eat takeaway every night. I can't give stuff that puts in the oven that you just stick in the oven. You actually have proper responsibilities. And as well as, you know, you're looking after a family and a child and making sure that everyone else is okay. I mean, my partner, she's a nurse, so she's at work every day. So I am, it is just me and Isabella at home. So yeah, I am, you know, doing almost full-time parenting there as well as trying to work at the same time. So, yeah. How are you yeah. keeping her distracted while you're trying to get work done? Well, this is the thing. Um, so I've almost tried to negotiate that I do sort of later shifts. So I would essentially to try and start it too. Kate tries to do eight, she's, she's not on the wards or anything. So she does, her, her job is eight to four, essentially most days or seven, three. So she'll be home by about three thirty, four thirty when she can. So I'll often try and negotiate to work from two till 10. So from two o'clock, <laughs> it's quite amusing sometimes because that's when I'll try and get Isabella down for her afternoon nap. And so I'll try and um, I'll be literally having her on my arm while on my phone going through like Google Drive trying to start writing articles while she's asleep on me. And then obviously that obviously it transfers onto my laptop. So when Kate's home, I can sort of jump back on and just carry on from there. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be quite tough like that. Yeah, Especially if she doesn't want to go to sleep when she's supposed to. Yeah. I find I get really wakes up annoyed. Early. Yeah. You think, right, it's two o'clock, James needs his nap now. Mm -hmm. When he goes down, I'll, I'll fire out some emails or something. Yeah. I'll jump on social media and get a bit done on there. Yeah. And then they won't sleep. And I find myself getting really, really cross if James won't sleep. And of course, if I'm tense, he won't sleep yeah. on me. And exactly. You, this you is make it, this yeah. awful yeah. cycle, don't yeah. you? Mm -hmm. Well, if yeah. I ever have to do an early shift now, well, in the last couple of weeks, we will send her back to nursery. And then, you know, you feel guilty. as like, oh, am I putting her in danger? Or is this, you know, bad thing? Or, you know and um yeah and that just weighs on you as well and that's again the complexities of what we're living through at the moment but um touch with everything has been fine so far and um yeah. may continue <laughs> it's great that you've got that option that's really good that you can, yeah. you can pop her in and i think part of the problem has been you go on social media and there was a stage when when the government first announced that the schools were going to start to reopen everyone went nuts no no i'm not sending my child in and if you were considering sending your child to like, because for us, it's a choice because our kids are so little and I'm, yeah. um, Harry's not back yet, but he will be next month. Yeah. And it's exactly like you say, you feel guilty firstly for like not spending all day at home with them, but also for putting them at risk for coronavirus. Yeah. Well, so. I, but initially we, I mean, obviously I was concerned about it enough as it was. And then I was on the phone to one of my friends who doesn't have kids <laughs> and I mentioned it to him. I was like, yeah, we're sending Izzy back to nursery just because like, was because I was talking about work and he just sort of was like, Oh really? Just kind of like that. And yeah. I don't think he intended to make me feel bad, but the way he's went, Oh really? I was like, wait, hold on. This is somebody without kids is probably more concerned or appearing to show more concern for the situation than I am. And yeah. I'm like, and then I had that in my head and, you know, trying to overthink that for a while. And then, you know, the internet can be the greatest place on earth and can be the worst place on earth. And am I allowed to mention mum's net? <laughs> yeah, of course you are. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just Googled, <laughs> um, am I, are you sending your kids back to school? Because you know, what else are you going to Google? And, um, yeah, yeah. obviously you led to mum's net and then uh, just people arguing after about five minutes, you're like, okay, now enough of that. I'm not reading anymore. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, the judgment and the anger and everything like that. And sometimes you're like, right, I don't need that in my head as well as my own personal yeah. trauma that I'm trying to get over here with sending my kid back to nursery and I think it takes a while as a parent to get into the mindset of do you know what I need to ignore what everybody else thinks and just go with me yeah like go with whatever my my yeah. gut feeling is definitely so yeah, because, 
because anyone arguing either way can come up with a, a rational point where you're like actually i agree with yeah. that, and then they're two contrasting opinions and then you say to yourself well which one do i take then yeah yeah, yeah. definitely i did want to speak to you a bit about um how you're feeling with everything that's going on and and just having isabella sort of impact how how the protests make you feel yeah absolutely it's um i mean you know straight off the bat i'm going to say i think protesting is correct um, I mean, people are talking about putting pe others at risk because of the virus and weighing on the services and things like that. But, you know, the protests are important. Protests affect change. And, you know, people have tried to be nice and ask politely for years, but nothing gets done. I mean, the, the prime example, obviously, being the statue in Bristol, the Colston statue that was t torn down. I mean, nobody... You can say, oh, yeah, well, vandalism is wrong, blah, 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 etc. But these people have tried to write letters, polite letters to their local councils and government to get this the statue taken down and with no effect. And some people just push to the edge, aren't they? And this is essentially what it is to the protest on a lower level. I mean, I'm not going to let people focus on the minority of incidents that descend into trouble. Most of the protests are peaceful. I went to one locally not one in, in central London, but one locally in Crystal Palace last Saturday. And it was just a really vibrant atmosphere. I think I, te I text Kate because she was at home looking after Isabella. And I said, um, it almost feels like a carnival atmosphere because all the cars are driving past, they're beeping their horns, hopefully in support, and everyone just chanting and cheering. And um, yeah, it was all very sort of calm and everyone was actually socially distanced because it was on the perimeter of Crystal Palace Park. So everyone was sort of stood in safe enough space well, like gaps from each other while protesting yeah, yeah. and it was it was an effect because it went all the way down the road and around the part the, the out like say the perimeter of the park and um yeah obviously having a child who is going to grow up mixed race in this country the idea that equality is important is you know obviously that's that's how i feel and i think it's even more important now with a child who's going to have to deal with this sort of thing so hopefully you know change will be affected and for the most part in terms of education yeah we talk about sort of nurseries and schools and things like that hopefully what these protests will do is get people actually learning reading studying and understanding why these protests are necessary and why people say black lives matter without needing a response of all lives matter Absolutely. It's, it's crazy to me that people probably don't want to go too long down this road, but it's crazy to me that people are still responding with All Lives Matter because it's this is the time to sit and learn. This is the time to like listen well, to what uh, people are telling us, surely. I mean, this is the thing. It's like I say, it's uh, education, which is the most important thing. People really need to listen and learn. That's it, it. It's not always, you know, easy to get people to admit that they don't know something or that they are ignorant of a subject Th that's it people get defensive as soon as you say oh you don't know about that they will get defensive and say no what i don't need to know about that or yeah. say what i do know is this and yeah but that's it you know and this is it like we talk about for the next generation having a ch having children hopefully they are i mean the big thing i'm i want to see change is the curriculum so ha actually let's introduce this into schools you know we talk about the statues again let's build a massive slavery museum or a black history museum in the middle of London, make that an essential part of primary school children's trips every single year. Yeah. And then put that on and let people grow and be educated rather than, you know, we, we, I don't want to go down too, too much down the route of how history is taught in schools in this country, but you know, it's a problem. <laughs> If it were in that sense of people understanding what goes on, unless somebody tells you outside of your school about something, you're not going to understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, I've been quite shocked by like the amount of resources that are being shared, and I'm, I mean, even just the the uh, slave trader in Bristol, I mm. didn't know who he was until well, last yeah, week. Exactly. I didn't know anything about it, but now yeah. I do. I, now I know the background of Baden Powell and things like that. It's it's really. I don't yes. think we can hide away from those facts because if you hide away from it, you're not learning from it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yes. I mean, people are saying, oh, you should keep up the statue so people understand. But, uh, you know, if the statues are making people uncomfortable, like, I mean, I, I thankfully, yeah. I don't believe there's anything around where I live of a former slave owner. But if there was, I would be 
I would be massively uncomfortable and obviously yeah. like talk about children. I wouldn't want Isabella to grow up somewhere where they glorify someone who owns slaves. Yeah. So there's no doubt that Winston Churchill was a great leader for this country in World War II, but he has a lot, a lot of problems beyond that that people need to understand and learn about before they go and blindly say, oh, Churchill was great, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of other things there. There's so many layers to his character that people need to understand before they blindly defend him. If you could say something to Isabella now about what is going on with these protests, for her to understand a little bit when she's a bit older, what would you say to her? People want change. It will all, you look out throughout, throughout history, people will want the change of their circumstances to make it better when they feel like it is not going their way. And on this, it was too important to ignore for this long. And hopefully by the time she does hear it, or see it or I speak to her back in the future things will have changed for the better I'm trying to find a way of like reeling this back to freelancing now we've had this really interesting conversation uh, which is amazing um <laughs> if you were a a parent of a little one like us and you were considering freelancing but a little bit nervous about and both you and I were forced into the situation from redundancy but yeah. actually even that if so if you're a parent who's been made redundant and you're considering freelancing well, they, right well, now, well it's not yeah you think i mean the the job situation for a lot of people a lot of people are in a lot of trouble financially off the back of you know the, the announced today about how much the economy shrink shrunk in the last quarter and everything like that but um yeah and jobs people jobs are going to go the way of working is going to change in future there's going to be a lot of home working a lot of people that depend on having to go into places to work will end up losing those jobs as companies end up streamlining and things like that so um um I would say never rule it out if you are in a position where you may need to freelance or contract or not have a permanent job. Don't rule it out. Investigate it. Be, you know, the idea of being self-employed is terrifying for a lot of people who have never been. I mean, people, there'll be people in their 40s, 50s who have worked in a job all their lives. Yeah. And it comes down to now, it's like, well, actually you're out of a job and probably not going to get hired anywhere at the moment so the idea of going self-employed if you do have a trade skill something and you know don't don't rule it out that's what i'd say just look into it there's enough again what we're talking about in the last subject there's enough resources and there's enough help out there to help people get along and i would say if you have to then by all means do it 